welcome to Stand By. Lights, camera, action. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon, eat fresh. These days, it's pretty easy to educate yourself on how movies are made, on the filmmaking process. There's no end of literature, websites, and YouTube channels discussing film theory, film craft, and the business side of the film industry. Most Blu-rays and DVDs come with some special features, ranging from a two-minute featurette to whole feature-length documentaries, four audio commentaries, two hours of deleted scenes, and three different cuts of the film. There's always something to learn, and always a means to learn it, with little barrier of entry. But that's something we've worked gradually towards. The first film school was founded in Russia in 1919, and there were a few others scattered around the world, but film schools in the United States didn't really kick off until the 1960s with institutions like the California Institutes of the Arts and the Columbia University School of the Arts. This was also the time that celebrity film critics started popping up, like Roger Ebert, Leonard Maltin, and Pauline Kael. And with them, writings on the history of filmmaking and greater understandings of the filmmaking process. For the longest time, the image that Hollywood and the film industry was trying to sell of itself was that of the glamorous movie star, the beautiful people who made dreams come true on the silver screen. Even films about filmmaking were about the actors in front of the camera, not the people behind them. During the 40s and 50s, you were more likely to hear about a screenwriter this way. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the that's basic not principles the of Americanism. That's not the question. One of the first big exceptions to this came from Walt Disney, who saw marketing potential in showing off his famous animated films and how they were created on a series of television specials, even getting into the nitty gritty of the Disney Studios' technological advancements. One of the first television shows dedicated to filmmaking and film history was the 1963 NBC show. Hollywood and the Stars. While it was still mostly focused on Hollywood's movie star machine, it would occasionally discuss things like genre, and every once in a while focus on the creation of a single film. We were warming up to the idea that there was a market for people who wanted to know how movies were made. But the thing that really kicked it off wasn't Ebert or Disney, it was the movies themselves. Jaws, 1975, Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1977, Superman, 1978, Alien, 1979, The Empire Strikes Back, 1980, Raiders of the Lost Ark, 1981. The blockbuster era of films had arrived, when glamorous movie stars were replaced with explosions and special effects. You had fresh-faced directors coming out of those new film schools and producing genre movies with a clarity never before seen on the big screen. Genre movies were coming back in a big way, science fiction, fantasy, horror, all attracting a new generation of filmgoers. Many, many young people who ate these films up wanted to know, how do they do that? How does Superman fly? How did they create all those alien monsters? How did they pull off those death-defying stunts? This was when the market for behind-the-scenes media really opened up as a mainstream product and it was already bleeding into Nickelodeon by 1982. Prosthetic makeup artist Tom Savini being a guest on Livewire, Studio C taking you on a tour around their editing station and chatting with Rick Baker, Spread Your Wings profiling a young stunt actor. A dedicated show about filmmaking might be just what the channel needed. Enter Standby Lights, Camera, Action. There's blood and gore and more on Standby Lights, Camera, Action. You'll see how they really don't hack people up in Conan the Barbarian. Leonard Nimoy gets a surprise special effect. And on the set of E.T., director Steven Spielberg sets Elliot in the right direction. Let's go to the movies. Watch Standby Lights, Camera, Action every Saturday at 11 Eastern, 10 Central, only on Nickelodeon. Beginning in October of 1982, Standby Lights, Camera, Action was an hour-long program hosted by Leonard Nimoy that focused on the behind-the-scenes of films that were currently in production, mostly genre blockbusters like E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Conan the Barbarian, and Krull. Each film would get a 12-14 to 14 minute segment and often focus on a few select scenes and how specific effects and extreme makeup were employed. For example, in a segment for the James Bond film Octopussy, we get a deep look into how the filmmakers pulled off this moment where Bond is attacked by a buzzsaw yo-yo. 
To kill Bond, his assassin will lower a yo-yo-like buzzsaw to do its deadly damage. Yes. So on action, I will go like this. And I've got to get off there without knocking that off the ground. I might need that. Special effects men ready the saw and fasten down the pillow for the action, making sure the pillow will not spin away when struck by the blade. In close-up, the murderous strike of the yo-yo buzzsaw can be controlled by a special effects man holding the blade steady, fastened to a pole, with no danger to the stars. Getting ready to film the dangerous sequence again, the special effects department is called in. Each episode also had a theme, like stunts, or prosthetics, or kid actors and there would be an extended segment of Nimoy interviewing one or more people in that field, oftentimes getting active demonstrations on what those people do, like this one with special effects makeup artist Tyler Smith. My hand goes in here. Yes, your hand fits in there. That becomes my arm. Right. And I manipulate what with this? You, there's two rings in there that you can grab. What have I got working? Tell me. And the rings open the mouth, happening? which is moving, and the eyes, which are moving also. Wow. All right. Wow. Didn't I see you in Geek Maggot Bingo? Tyler, with this head, I could win two Academy Awards. Looks pretty good. <laughs> and that's it, really. The show is a pretty easy one to summarize, and one that's very hard to get wrong. It's so simple that it's hard to imagine it took so long for there to be a show like this in the first place. Just show kids how movies are made, focus mostly on genre films that kids will love, and have it hosted by someone who's just an all-around great presenter but also someone who's famously tied to the genre media of the time. Leonard Nimoy was a great fit for the program. Standby premiered about four months after the release of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, and Spock's dramatic sacrifice in that film was resonating strongly with audiences. Nimoy, on his part, had just wrapped up a gig hosting In Search Of, a show about the paranormal, aliens, Bigfoot, psychic powers, that kind of stuff, and was probably in the market for another steady hosting gig. He seemed to like what Nickelodeon was doing. Nickelodeon has a good attitude toward children. Well, quote of the century there, printed up in all the posters. Reportedly, the one condition Nimoy had for hosting was that the show not introduce him as Star Trek's Mr. Spock. Now, Nimoy loved playing Spock, but there were times in his career where he tried to stay away from it, to not be typecast as Spock. Famously, his 1975 autobiography was titled I Am Not Spock, which was meant to create a separation between the character Spock and the actor Leonard Nimoy, but a lot of Star Trek fans, who couldn't have been bothered to actually read the book, took the title as a rejection of Spock. It got so bad that in 1995, Nimoy had to publish a second autobiography titled I Am Spock, just to even things out. In any case, standby lights camera action came right at the end of one of Nimoy's I Am Not Spock periods. With The Wrath of Khan, Nimoy was starting to find himself creatively rejuvenated with Star Trek again. He not only wanted to keep playing Spock, but to direct the next couple of Star Trek movies. Production for Star Trek III The Search for Spock began in 1983, while Nimoy was still hosting the show. And you can bet they took full advantage of that with an entire episode focused on the film's production. And Nimoy was just as involved in making the episode as he was the movie. I recently taped a segment of Standby Lights Camera Action. The Nickelodeon cable TV show is hosted by Leonard Nimoy and, not surprisingly, is about movies and how they're made. The show I was asked to appear on was specifically themed around Star Trek. In the course of four hours, I watched Nimoy tape a half a dozen segments, always in control of the situation. Joking to ease the tension, smiling through countless retakes, rewriting scripts on the spot, assisting the director, the cameraman, etc. Alas, I don't have any footage of the Star Trek 3 episode. I don't have any complete episodes, actually. There's been no home video release, probably due to the rights of the movie footage. And actually, this show doesn't lend itself well to VHS recordings, even though it aired as late as 1987 and is pretty good. The show is very segmented. You have your interviews and you have two or three segments on different movies. You might not be interested in everything an episode has to offer, and you might not record everything. 
It's easy to imagine a kid going through the TV listings on their local paper, find this week's episode of standby lights, camera, action. Oh, let's see. Return of the Black Stallion? Eh, who cares? Never Say Never Again? Isn't Sean Connery, like, old now? Oh, what's this? The Secret of Nim? Animation? Might as well warm up the VCR for that bit. In costuming Mrs. Brisby, we tried several ideas. When, when we first got the idea of using this mouse, we needed a nice country bumpkin look. And so we tried different things. And one of the artists came up with something that looked like this, and we thought, that looks just a little too, um, too happy, you know, too affluent. So we tried something a little different, more country. And this looks a little too overdone. I mean, she couldn't move around in this kind of costume, and Brisby herself objected to this. So we said, why couldn't we get something that looks a little freer? So. We tried letting her ears down to the side of her head and putting the hair down like this. And we put a little red cape on her. She didn't like that at all. And it doesn't look very feminine. So somebody suggested that if we took the ears and pushed them up on top of her head, like all her hair had been piled on top of her head, and pushed this hair up, we would probably get a very cute looking little mouse. It's no surprise then that the easiest segment of this show to find was the one they did for Star Wars Episode VI, Return of the Jedi. Oh, there's something else I'd like to explain. Very often when a film is in production, it has what's known as a working title. Revenge of the Jedi was the working title. The original title was Return of the Jedi. The film company went back to the original. Now, let's roll the trailer for Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Actually, most of the clips from the show I've managed to find come from archives of various people and groups who are featured on the show. For example, this segment on 2010, The Year We Make Contact, I found on a Helen Mirren fan site. You've probably noticed the watermark that this James Bond fan site put on the Octopussy footage. There's a chance these clips come from complete episodes in somebody's tape collection, but nobody's had the incentive yet to upload an entire episode. Altogether, I've managed to find about an hour's worth of clips. I know the first season was given a full 12 episode order, and through newspaper TV listings I've been able to identify at least 22 unique episodes, with new ones being produced as late as 1985, covering films like Back to the Future and Out of Africa. But an exact episode and season count still eludes us. Nickelodeon surveyed some of the really big stars of Standby Lights Camera Action to find out if they know what time it's on Nickelodeon. So what do you say, Jim Belushi? Hurry! No, that's not right. Tom Hanks. Okay, how about Huey Lewis? I didn't really prepare. Nice excuse. What can you tell us, Michael J. Fox? I'm making my movie. Excuse me. These big shots are too important to care about seeing themselves on TV, so we'll clue you in. Standby Lights Camera Action is on every Saturday and Sunday at 4, 3 Central. Got it, you guys? Don't be a nutch. On Nickelodeon. The show originally aired every other week, alternating its spot with Reggie Jackson's World of Sports. Jerry Laybourne called this checkerboard scheduling, and for her this was a problem, as it was very easy to lose track of what was airing any given week. Reggie Jackson? I thought this was Leonard Nimoy week. That scheduling was one of the very first things Laybourne changed when she took over for Schneider in 1984, but Laybourne seemed to like the show itself, and it kept running for a while. And What's not to like? Nimoy is warm and game for whatever they put him through. The behind the scenes stuff is well done. The most negative reaction you could have to a show like this is, eh, I'm just not all that interested in movie making. Now you may have noticed a quote earlier from Howard Zimmerman, then editor of Starlog, a science fiction magazine that focused on science fiction in general and Star Trek in specific. And that was growing into printing multiple magazines under the Starlog brand. While the exact details are unclear, Nickelodeon seemed to have some kind of working relationship with Starlog, as they intersected more than once for standby lights camera action. One of the magazines printed for Starlog was Cinemagic, which focused on movie special effects and makeup. Standby was featured in both Starlog and Cinemagic, and the show returned the favor by dedicating an episode to the Cinemagic SVA short film search an amateur film contest in association with the School of Visual Arts in New York City. The contest was for 15-minute science fiction, fantasy, and horror shorts in either live action or animation. 
One of the filmmakers profiled on standby was a young Joey album and his animated film Bandits. Joey, congratulations. Nice work. I understand we have to congratulate you again now because you've just finished working on a feature film. Can you tell us about it? That's right. It's a film called Wild Style, and I worked on a title sequence for it uh, with a graffiti artist whose name is Zephyr, and that features uh, rap music and break dancing and the whole hip-hop scene. Uh, they had a segment on this show with the winners, and so... I got to uh, be interviewed by Leonard Nimoy. You know. uh, he could not have been nicer, you know. He, he took an interest in what we presented him. Um, he was genuinely enthusiastic. Uh, just, just a really great guy. Alba would end up becoming a regular feature on Nickelodeon, doing the animation for several of the channel's iconic bumpers, including the doo as well as animation and graphic design for shows like Kids Court, Eureka's Castle, Gullah Gullah Island, and Blue's Clues. You may remember his work when we talked about Nick's Thanksgiving Fest, and his pitch for a show called Thunder Lizards was considered for the channel when they were creating their original Nicktoons. He almost made the first batch of Nicktoons. So, yeah, an important person for Nickelodeon's visual identity in the late 80s and into the 90s. So here's Nickelodeon interviewing him in 1982. <laughs> this is the cell, right? This is the cell, right? and this is the background. Uh -huh. And the reason you do it on a separate cell is so that um, you don't have to keep drawing the background over again. Uh -huh. Now, in this particular scene, it's just eight cells that are, are repeated over and over again. To get the motion going. Get the motion, right. and then the background doesn't have to be redrawn. So and here's Nickelodeon interviewing him in 1990. <laughs> Meet Joey Album, a cartoon creator who's made lots of cartoons you've probably seen on Nickelodeon. And Joey told Zap that for every second of his cartoons, he has to make at least 12 drawings. And once those drawings are finished, they get traced with ink, painted, and photographed one at a time. And eventually, what started out as a drawing turns into a cartoon. You are expecting burgers and fries, maybe? It just gives you a great sense of joy that when everything works and all the colors are there and the motion is there and... That's what it's all about. <laughs> Listen to that ham putting it on. While well, Album has said it wasn't his standby appearance that got him a job at Nickelodeon, one can't deny the truth of the phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Incidentally, Nickelodeon loved the Cinemagic SVA short film search, and Standby Lights Camera Action wasn't the only show to feature it. Some of the most sought-after episodes of Livewire were the student film and video festival episodes, of which there were at least three, which also featured films and filmmakers from the contest. I've had multiple people ask me about these episodes since putting up the knickknacks on Livewire, but sadly they all remain lost. Not everyone wants to be a filmmaker, but for every kid in 1982 who wanted to get behind the movie camera, Nickelodeon was the channel to watch. Nickelodeon around this time was known as a green vegetable channel, a channel full of programs that were what adults thought were good for children. And in a lot of places that was true. But there were also programs like Standby Lights Camera Action, which took the hobbies and interests that many young people already had and engaged with them fully. Even an adult like myself, living in the age of the internet and DVD special features, can get something out of this show. And that's a win in my book. Nick, 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 Next time, what happens in a store after it closes? Dancing mannequins, rhyming mice, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. Today's shout out goes to How to Enter and Win Film Contests, an Alan Gadney guide. This 1981 book has a lot of information about then-contemporary film contests and festivals, including a section on the Cinemagic SVA short film search. Thank you all for watching. If you like what you've been seeing, perhaps consider supporting me on Patreon. The more I make, the better the show can be. You can also support the channel by subscribing, hitting that bell icon for notifications, liking the video, leaving a comment, following me on Twitter, and of course, sharing knickknacks with your friends and family. See you next time.